want to invite Dr. David Lee, who is our former chief medical officer. And Dr. Lee is now the medical director of philanthropy. He joined the foundation team. Medical director of philanthropy is a position that was first started at the Mayo Clinic. And for those of you who may not know, VHC Health is a member of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. We have been for over, over seven years. And uh, there's only 50 other community uh, hospitals across the, you know, well, actually all over the world, technically, that are members of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. It's a very rigorous process to go through to, uh, to qualify and to stay in good standing to be part of the Mayo Clinic Care Network. So, Dr. Lee, come on up here. Okay, so everything I learned about public speaking was taught to me by Wakefield High School here in Arlington. <clears throat> so we can either give them the credit or give them the blame for how this talk turns out tonight. So um, my pitch tonight uh, isn't going to save a single life. But if it's done correctly, it could save your soul. It's palliative care and hospice. Um, People really don't really understand the difference between palliative care and hospice. I think if you throw out those terms, and I know Dr. Westerman over there can attest to this, people think of palliative care and hospice as giving up, of closing the chapter, of calling it quits. The further could be the truth. Palliative care is really about the here and now. You've got a diagnosis, you've got a disease, how do we take care of you? Your body, your mind, your spirit, how do we do all this in the final chapters of your life? All of us here, we're writing our stories. Some of us here are maybe towards the beginning of the book. Some of us here are maybe starting to write the final chapters. It's filled with a lot of highs, births, weddings, celebrations, and then filled with some lows, some sorrows, some sadness, some missed opportunities. But the last few chapters of a book, I feel like are always the most important because if you don't get a good ending, you're never gonna refer back to that book ever again. If you write a good final chapter, not only for yourself will you have gratification for the next life, your next journey, but all those who come to read that book will rejoice at a beautiful book and a life well read. So let me tell you uh, my little story. Um, I've had loss in my life. Um, recently, my dad passed. He was 98. A few years before, my mother passed. She was 87. So I've got good longevity genes. So I'm still in the middle of my book, OK? So. <laughs> Don't write me off just yet. So I'll tell you the story of uh, my mother and, and what happened to us. My mother, 87, this is a proud woman, uh, an immigrant from Korea. She had five children. She raised two doctors, a lawyer, two business owners. So in one generation, went from being poor to having a good, comfortable life for their family and children. So I'm very proud of that and what she was able to accomplish. She was a housewife. She uh, sometimes worked at Ted Lewis in Sherlington. Anybody remember Ted Lewis shop? Over uh, near the Bell and Company. That was before all these fancy places came in and all these uh, eateries came to be. So at 87, my mother was starting to fall. And the interval between falls became shorter and shorter. One day she fell. She couldn't get up. I didn't know what to do. I'm a doctor. I've been in the hospital. I've taken care of the sickest of sick. I've taken care of many thousands of people. I brought life into this earth. When my mother passed down and I couldn't get her up, I didn't know what to do. Who do you call? Well, what do you do? We all call, we all call 911 because that's what we're trained to do. That's how we get help. So 911, ambulance comes. They pick her up, put her in the gurney, take her to the hospital. She's still not talking. She's still out. She can't get up. Blood tests, scans, brain scans, where's Ivan? 
I'm sure Ivan probably read the scan. There was some blood under her skull and her brain. What do you do? All the neurosurgeons came to me. They're all my friends. They said, Dave, she's got blood under her skull covering her brain. We need to drain it. I said, she's 87. She doesn't walk. She fell. She can't get up. She's not talking. Some Parkinson's dementia has really robbed her of, of her life and who she was. So with my family, we convened, we cried, we talked. We finally had someone from palliative care visit us. And with that, gave us some hope. We could take her home. Our two choices given to us as have her stay at the hospital, more scans, have surgery, cut out her skull, drain the blood. Would that give her her life back? No one could guarantee. The other choice is palliative care. We're going to make it so easy for you. We're going to give you a number to call. We're going to have a nurse come visit you every day. We're going to set a porta potty next to the bed so she can get up and toilet. We're going to get one of those fancy beds where the head comes comes up and she can handle her secretions. So at that point, the choice seemed easy. We took her home. I live in McLean now, close to where I grew up in Arlington. We set up our dining room. We had the bed with the head that comes up. We had the toilet next to her. We had the beautiful drapes parted so she could look out on the driveway and the front yard. And all was good. She wasn't speaking. She wasn't really eating. Didn't take long. A matter of a few days. My sisters were there. My father was there. They cared for her. They fed her some soup when they could. Gave her some liquid when they could. I don't know. When you're withering, somehow you get really thirsty. You need liquids. You can't put down the hot dog, but somehow soup and water can go down every now and then. But you know what? It didn't take long. In a matter of several days, I saw her kind of fade, wither. Her breathing became intermittent. And slowly but surely, she took a breath. Pause became longer. And then at some point, took that last breath, and she was gone. But you know, if you were to write your own storybook ending, I think all of us would probably mimic something like that. You're at home. You're comfortable. You're pain-free. You're surrounded by your loved ones. And you get to pick the terms in which you leave this earth. That's what palliative care and hospice can do for us. Not only do we need these services, but each of us should demand the right to write the final chapters of our book in a way that's meaningful for us and meaningful for those who come and read that book later. So as I mentioned before, this doesn't save a single life, but it can definitely save your soul. And the curious thing about palliative care, with many disease states, cancer, heart failure, uh, Ill, chronic illness, choosing the palliative care route actually gives you more time. You actually live longer in many instances. And you certainly live more comfortably during those last few days to weeks to months. So. Oh, I was supposed to play this during my talk. <laughs> Little soft music. So you know the curious thing about uh, mortality? If you look at mortality throughout the ages, it was not age related. You were just as likely to die at age one, age five, age 20, age 40, age 60, age 70, as you were in later years. So only recent history now, death is more associated with the elderly. But in times past, it could happen to anybody any time. You could be in a trauma, get an infection. 
and cancer uh, can happen at any time. Uh, one of my oldest son's classmates just succumbed to ovarian cancer at the age of 29. A beautiful, vibrant soul taken away too early. So the need is huge. We're getting older. 100 years ago, 2% of the population was over, say, 65. Today, we're approaching over 15%, getting close to 20% of our population over 65. So it's coming. Rates are rising, and we see a lot of these uh, folks coming to the hospital because they have nowhere else to go. Look at that. Dr. Westerman, he's only 2.6 certified prescribers out of 100,000 residents. It's a lonely number. We need a lot more. So that can run the gamut of inpatient palliative care. You've got 911. You've had a fall. Hospital, there's no hope. Maybe something better or different is down the road with inpatient palliative care. But really, the standard is outpatient, right? You don't want to wait till the last minute. That last chapter of your life, hopefully that's a big, long chapter. It's going to take a while to write. So you want to start that conversation early at the outpatient level. Community outreach. No one does anything by themselves. We're all part of uh, the community. The fabric is intertwined. We need each other to get through these. And how do you get there? Well, you got to educate people. There's 2.6 providers per 100,000. We need a lot more. So you need physicians. We need nurse practitioners, nurses. We need the facilities. We need education. How do you approach someone? Oftentimes, uh, I talk to the hospitalists at the hospital, and they say when they make that first pitch of palliative care to patients and families, it doesn't go very well because they don't, they don't believe it. That's not the last chapter that they're writing right there. That's only chapter 10, and this book has 15 chapters. So what are we asking? Six million dollars to close that gap. That's going to be a good place to start. All that will provide outpatient palliative care, inpatient palliative care, uh, recruitment, retention, training, education. Uh, this is a summary slide in between the little monikers. There's all these uh, needs and opportunity for palliative care. So that's my story. I'm still in the middle writing mine. I'll be happy to share your stories and where you are in your journey uh, afterwards. <laughs>